Hello, and thank you for joining us for this edition of Atheist Talk. I'm your host, Jack Caravella. In our last program, Dr. Grant Steves and I discussed the issue of translation as it applies to the Bible. Dr. Steves is eminently qualified to explore this topic with us. He holds a doctorate in theology from Marquette University, a master's degree in rhetorical criticism from the University of Illinois, and his library contains over 200 different translations of the Bible. Today we're going to focus on how and in what ways interpretation has influenced the translation of the Bible, transforming it from the early texts into the book people know today. Then we'll take on two specific controversies arising from competing interpretations. Grant, thanks so much for being with us to share your knowledge. Thank you for having me. Well, we'll start with a broad question, and that is, how has interpretation influenced the translation of biblical text? Why not just translate word for word? On a previous, a previous episode, we, we sort of covered the, the controversy between translation and interpretation. Mm -hmm. And what I really wanted to stress at that time was that we, we take for granted the translation part of it. We figure that the person who's doing the translating knows the language, knows the culture, and is going to convey the message that the original author had with as much clarity and precision as possible. I had a professor at the university who used to say that communication is a happy accident. And that's talking about English. Mm -hmm. Say nothing about trying to make it in from one language into another language. The point is that, and, and I made reference to the uh, uh, translator of the Koran, who said, really, what you're doing is an interpretation because the person who's doing the translating has biases or has areas of knowledge that need to be expanded, simply not there. And so interpretation is probably a more accurate way of stating it. The problem with word for word or word for meaning is that if I select a word I still have my bias, which word I'm going to take. And we'll see that as we go through the different examples. And when I make a choice in terms of meaning, then I really have a broad spectrum in terms of what the choices are. Take, for example, and this is from the Evangelical Parallel New Testament. So there are eight different translations or versions in here. And we're going to take and look at two rather common examples that most people are familiar with. Mm -hmm. One would be the Lord's Prayer. I think most people are familiar with the Lord's Prayer. Even, even people who don't pray are familiar with the Lord's Prayer. So if you take the New King James Version, mm -hmm. which is going to be much the same as the Old King James, mm -hmm is our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That's a word for word, almost a lit what it would call a literal translation. Now, this is what happens when you put it in the hands of a, of a freelancer, <laughs> the dynamic translation. Our Father in heaven, so far so good. Reveal who you are. Now, on all the other translations that are here, there's nothing about revealing who he is. Mm -hmm. But here, the Message Bible wants a revelation. Let the world, set the world right. Do what's best, as above, so below. Now, that's sort of common English. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Keep us alive with three square meals. Mm -hmm. Now we're moving closer to the kind of a mm -hmm. slang mm -hmm. version. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. Now here's where we really go off the march. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're a blaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. Which is comparable to saying amen, amen, amen. Mm -hmm. But it's a very, very, very different mm. phrasing and word selection. He's going for the meaning, supposedly. Mm -hmm. But again, if you look at this, that last part, you're in charge, okay. Mm -hmm. I don't see that even implied in the other forms. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a blazing beauty, I really don't see that. Mm -hmm. But I guess it helps in some way to clarify it for mm -hmm. somebody out there. Right. But um, 
That's the difference between for word for word or right. the more dynamic uh, meaning based. Now you go to the Beatitudes, and I, I think you find the same kind of problem at work. Mm -hmm. So you have blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Here's Eugene Peterson at work in the Message Bible. Mm. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you there is more of God and his rule. Mm. So this is almost sounds like suicide. Mm. It's, it's a very dark form yeah. of blessed are the poor in spirit. Mm -hmm. There's, there is a qualitative and quantitative difference between mm. those expressions. You're bound to have a different interpretation than mm. as the reader of the text. Say nothing about the person who did the translating. Mm. He's already had his chance at making the interpretation. Now it's your turn to interpret the interpretation. Mm. No, we don't know where you're going to go with that mm. at that point. Mm. Uh, I have another example that I think is, is, is noteworthy. And it comes from the book of John 21, 15 through 19. Mm -hmm. And I like this example because almost all of your translations create a problem here. Mm -hmm. Both those that are word for word and for meaning for meaning. And, mm -hmm. and yet it's a very simple problem that could be solved. Presumably there's this, this dialogue that goes on between Jesus and Peter. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to paraphrase. And it sounds like a country western song is what, what I always say. It's, Jesus says, do you love me? Mm -hmm. And Peter says, you know I love you. Mm -hmm. and Jesus says, well, do you love me? Mm -hmm. And Peter says, you know I love you, Lord. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus says again, do you love me? And Peter says, well, of course I love you. Mm -hmm. Now, as I said, this sounds like an old country western song. Somewhat redundant. Somewhat <laughs> redundant. But, and there's, that's not to, to make a negative comment about mm -hmm. what country western music necessarily. Mm -hmm. The comment is because it doesn't tell you what the real conversation is about. Mm. And especially in our modern age, we use word love. Mm -hmm. you know, I love pizza, I love my mother-in-law, and I love my mother. Mm -hmm. I love my sisters, I love my brothers. Mm -hmm. you know, is this the same kind of love mm. equally distributed between the pizzas and the people that I right. I don't think so. Yeah. And that's the problem in this particular case too. So Jesus is using the Greek word agape, which is almost exclusively used by Christians, mm -hmm. as a spiritual kind of love and relationship. Mm -hmm. And Peter, on the other hand, is using the Greek word philia, hmm. which is Philadelphia, the mm -hmm. city of brotherly love. Mm. So it's an affection mm -hmm. and a relationship of brotherhood, one right. might call it, for right. another person. Mm -hmm. So one is saying, do you have this deep spiritual commitment to me? Mm -hmm. And the other is, well, you know, I like you. Mm. <laughs> you <know? Okay. laughs> well, now that makes a different kind mm. of interpretation, different sense mm -hmm. in what is being said in that particular verse. Right. But that shows how interpretation and translation what we think is translation, mm -hmm. can really change what the meaning is of the text itself. Right. And unfortunately, when you look at these eight translations, mm -hmm. they're all going to go for love. Mm. Right. And, and it, they should look beyond that. Huh. Well, that's word choice. One thing we didn't get into as much in the previous program was doctrine. How does doctrine right. influence those well, choices? You have doctrine and you have biases in terms of the value systems that people have. Mm -hmm. Both of these are at work. Mm -hmm. King James, in the King James Version of the Bible, 1611 roughly, uh, brought together this committee and he divided them up in groups. Mm -hmm. And he had one mandate that he did put forth. Mm -hmm. And by the way, this is in uh, a book on the secretaries of the, of the Bible, King James secretaries or something. Mm -hmm. And he said, I want you to emphasize the power of the king. Mm. Why? Mm. Well, because he was moving away from the Catholic Church. He was establishing mm. his own. And it really helps to emphasize what is called the divine right of kings. Mm -hmm. And it's based on, on Paul's book to the Romans, mm -hmm. chapter 13, verse 1, where you say very clearly there's no no uh, interpretation necessary here. Um, even in translation, I think it, it comes across fairly strongly that essentially uh, you have to obey the authorities mm -hmm. of, the, of the secular world. Mm -hmm. And thin paper and fat fingers don't work. Uh, <laughs> well, it has to be thin papered if it all those translations in that, one volume. That's volume. true. That's very true. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, 
for there is no authority except that which God has established. Hmm. So essentially the kings have the divine right, they have the birthright, mm -hmm. there you go. Right. And you don't question it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't consider democracies, for mm. example. Right. Uh, they don't have the same, or do they have the same kind of authority? Mm. You're, now here is the Message Bible might actually be preferable in a democracy mm. because he says, be a good citizen. Mm. All governments are under God insofar as there is peace and order. It's God's order. Mm. So live responsibly as a citizen. Mm. Doesn't that sound pretty democratic? Mm -hmm. Whereas the other ones, right. definitely kings. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> now, the other scripture that they tried to help good old King James with, mm -hmm. uh, again, we're turning to a um, uh, uh, work by, by Paul, mm -hmm. and it's the Hebrews. And in Hebrews, he tries to emphasize a little bit differently something. And, and the interesting thing is, depending upon translation, and interpretation, you come out with a kind of a different answer. Mm -hmm. It's again chapter 13, only this time it's verse 17. Obey your leaders and act under their authority. Mm. They are watching over you because they are responsible for your souls. Obey them so that they will do their work with joy and not sadness. Hmm. It will not help you to make their work hard. Hmm. So if you take a translation here, you can move it toward the governing secular authorities. Right. But if you look at it from other translations, it seems to imply spiritual authorities. Oh. So it would be the church rather mm -hmm. than the king. Right. But remember, when the king got rid of the pope, mm -hmm. he became the head of the church too. Mm -hmm. So he was the divine ruler right. in, a, in, a, in a sense. Right. But that shows you how you take language mm -hmm. and you use it to support a particular bias or belief, right. which in this case is the divine right of kings. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you take the doctrinal side of it. Take John 1.1, 1, 1, mm -hmm. which I've spoken of before. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Mm -hmm. God is divine. Mm -hmm. Or when you look at the second theos, is it translated in the Word was God? Some translated as the Word was divine. They see it as an adjective. Mm -hmm. Or the Word was a God. Mm -hmm. Or some other kind of translation or interpretation. Right. If you want to support the Trinity, you're going to do it one way. And mm -hmm. if you want to sort of open it up to question and thinking, mm -hmm. you might translate it in a different way. Yeah. Another example of a doctrine, or at least a teaching of the church, is that, is, is that of the virginity of, of Mary. Mm -hmm. uh, the Catholic Church went from just prior to Jesus being a virgin to being virgin forever. Mm. I see. Uh, so you have this scripture in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 4. Mm -hmm where you can translate the word, Hebrew word, as a young woman, mm -hmm. young maiden, or as a virgin. Mm -hmm. Now, I think a person could be a young maiden or a young woman without mm -hmm. being a virgin. Right. And you can be a virgin and be a young woman. Mm -hmm. but, but there's some complications here. Right. So if you're a Catholic and you're doing a translation, Mm -hmm. Your interpretation, your bias is going to be toward using the word virgin mm -hmm. rather than a young maiden or a young woman. Right. That's an example of how word choice mm -hmm. really is dictating By doctrine. Uh, the doctrine, or the doctrine is dictating the word choice. Yes, you mentioned briefly uh, the Trinity, and I understand there's been some controversy over how the concept has been handled. Can you explain that to us and start perhaps with a definition of the Trinity? Oh yeah. <laughs> by way of by way of introduction, the the speculation in regards to the nature of Jesus is mm -hmm. what we're talking about. Right. Uh, so, assuming that there there is this person named Jesus, mm -hmm. and he dies roughly thirty C.E. something mm -hmm. like that, thirty five. Um, what is his nature? Mm -hmm. Is he God? Mm -hmm. Was he God? Was he just a human being? Mm -hmm. Muslims think he, he was just a human being, mm -hmm. so the Jews. 
Was he a divine, mm. which would mean he could have been an angel, mm -hmm. see, rather than God? Mm -hmm. um, or was he both God and man mm -hmm. at the same time? Mm. Yeah. There, and you know, there are all kinds of configurations. Right. And for 300 years, you had people batting these different ideas around. Mm -hmm. Mm. I've always wondered why this wasn't clear at the beginning. Mm -hmm. That you here's here's one of the most important doctrines of the church, mm. presumably. Mm -hmm. And there's no clarity here. Mm. There's true debate and discussion and questioning about this. Why would you have that kind of confusion when you should have clarity? Mm -hmm. Well, we decided right away that we're going to solve this problem, and his name was the Emperor Constantine. Mm. He said, uh, we're going to call a council of all these religious leaders. Mm -hmm. Note, it's a secular authority. He's not a Christian, mm -hmm. and he's calling the council because he's having problems with the, with the masses mm -hmm. believing certain things and mm -hmm. having fights, in part. Mm -hmm. So he brings them together in, 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 at the Council of Nicaea. He conducts the sessions. He participates in the sessions. Mm -hmm. He weighs in. Mm -hmm. And as I've always said, most of the decisions of the Council of Nicaea probably were not conducted by the Holy Spirit, but it was by the ballot, and it's called politics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, that, and now you have, you have the, the, the decisions. But it is, in a sense, the first major alliance between the church and the state mm -hmm. in, in the history of the Christian religion. Mm -hmm. So you had two major points of view that come before the council. Mm -hmm. One was uh, advocated by uh, a, a man named Arius. Mm -hmm. He was a priest. He didn't have a lot of rank, in other mm -hmm. words. He wasn't a bishop or somebody like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Cardinal Newman, he's a good man, a Catholic man, mm -hmm. he said most of his arguments are based upon uh, scripture. Mm -hmm. This is in his book on the Arian heresy. Okay. And the Trinitarians, they based most of their argument on scripture plus Greek thought. Hmm. So take the argument that Arius presented. Because Arius did not believe that Jesus was God. Hmm. Uh, might have been a divine being, mm -hmm. but he was not God. Yet yeah, Arian is an early Christian. Arian is an early Christian, mm -hmm. and it was very popular. Mm -hmm. The Arian heresy, as it is now called, mm -hmm. was very popular. Arius was a very popular uh, a proponent of it. Mm -hmm. And you find it's really subordinationism, and you found it in Origen, and you find it in several of the other church, what are called church fathers, mm -hmm. that had this questioning belief. He starts out with the Old Testament scripture uh, found in Proverbs 8.22. And frequently those that do not believe in the Trinity will look at this scripture because supposedly Jesus is the wisdom that is discussed in that, chap that verse. Mm -hmm. What it boils down to is it, this wisdom was pre-existent, mm -hmm. but that it was created. It was the first of the creations of God. Mm -hmm. And then all other things were created through this wisdom mm -hmm. or the word. Mm -hmm. Well, that puts Jesus in a subordinate role. Mm. He then goes to the New Testament and he starts to go through several scriptures which are still used by people who believe in the Arian mm -hmm. heresy or that position. Matthew 20, 22. He said, I'm teaching for my father. Well, if they're co-equals, that would be a questionable right. comment. In Mark 13, 32, he, he, talking about the end of the world, the end of times, he said, only the Father knows. Mm. No one else, not even the Son knows. Mm. Well, if they're co-equal, they belong to the same Godhead or whatever, mm -hmm. you would think that he would know mm -hmm. that time. Right. John 5.19, the Son depends on the Father. Mm. Mm. That doesn't sound like equal, that sounds like dependency, right. and that's not an equal position. Mm -hmm. Or John 14, 28, I'm going to the Father. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are the Father or if you are part of the, the mm -hmm. Godhead, would you use that kind of an expression? Right. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 28, Son is in subjection to the Father. Mm -hmm. Again, 
there's a dependency, there's a difference in the role between these people. Right. Or Colossians 1.15, he is in the image of the Father. Hmm. He is not the Father, he is in the image. Right. Which should bring you back to the old comment that we are made in the image of God. Of God. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that we are God, right. it means just the image. Mm -hmm. And that is not physical. Mm. So you, you have to break this down in, in terms of you know, Arius made some sense. Mm -hmm. So the Trinitarians have their chance now to de mm. debate the question they get up. And as good old Cardinal Newman mm -hmm. said, it is based oftentimes on Greek philosophy. They use Greek philosophy to help them understand complex abstract matters. Mm -hmm. Plato's Trinity. Plato believed in God, mm -hmm. or a God mm -hmm. of some sort. He believed in ideas, which mm -hmm. is the word or wisdom, mm -hmm. and he believed in a spirit. Mm -hmm. That's his trinity. Mm -hmm. I'm only suggesting the relationship. I don't say that it is necessary directly, mm -hmm. but certainly the Greek language and the Greeks had influence mm -hmm. on the concept of the trinity as it was developed by the church. Right. Scriptural basis. Well, we've already mentioned John 1.1. 1, 1. Mm -hmm. Then there is 1 John 5, 7. Mm -hmm. This is the scripture that has been thrown out by almost every translator <laughs> that we know, mm. which they said some well-meaning monk who really believed in the Trinity mm -hmm. decided, we need to have more evidence of this, and I'll, I'll just insert it right here. Mm. <laughs> and, and that will be a proof text. I see. The other three scriptures, and they're all Paul-based, mm -hmm. Philippians 2, 5, 7, Colossians 1, 15 through 16, and Hebrews 1, 8, all have to do with the sonship in terms of being begotten mm -hmm. as opposed to created, mm -hmm. and that he is of the Father, uh, one essence of the, is the Father, one mm -hmm. uh, part of the Father. The, I think the interesting thing about the Trinity is they said it was a mystery then, it still is a mystery. Mm -hmm. The church teaches it as a mystery, really. Mm -hmm that it is not easy to explain, even with Greek, mm -hmm. uh, the totality of what the Trinity is. Mm -hmm. I think if you looked at the argument of Arius, it's much easier to understand. That doesn't mean that he's right. Mm -hmm. It just means it seems to be easier to understand. Right. And so you have these two competing ideas that are central doctrine mm -hmm. to the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. And there is confusion. There is not clarity. Mm -hmm. In terms now, these individuals who did these translations obviously think there's clarity. Mm. They haven't really looked at the question yet. Right, right. And they need to. <laughs> well, let's turn to a controversy that's more in the public eye these days, and that's about homosexuality right. and uh, the Bible's attitude towards it. Right. Um, could you explore that? Tell us how the controversy has affected Christianity. Well, anyone that is aware of the problems that are going on in the church today, and churches, Protestant, Catholic, the, the, the groups, uh, know that there are churches that have been split by this. Mm -hmm. They vote and they move out of, one keeps the church, the building, and the mm -hmm. other one goes find it, builds a new building. Mm -hmm. um, deep arguments, deep, deep uh, discussion of this and concern mm -hmm. about it. Uh, a relative of mine who's Lutheran said that if his, his particular church adopted the acceptance of gays and marriage, mm -hmm. he would leave the church. Mm -hmm. So there's some very strong feelings that are involved here. Mm -hmm. Now, when you go to the Bible, which presumably they base their faith on, mm -hmm. you go to Leviticus 18, 22, and Leviticus 20, verse 13. Man that lies with a man is going to be an abomination. Mm -hmm. That's one way of saying it. Mm -hmm. And they are put to death. Mm. Sentence is death. Mm. There is no, no lack of clarity there. All right. That's, that's one of those things that's nice to have clarity. Mm -hmm. If you don't like them, tell them mm -hmm. right up front. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. One of the ways that they deal with it is by saying, well, that's the Old Testament. We're under the New Covenant, under the New Testament. Mm -hmm. We don't have to obey that law. Mm -hmm. We could dismiss it, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Then we come to the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And we have three scriptures that we're going to look at. Mm -hmm. 1, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, Romans 1, 27, and 1 Timothy 1, 
9 through 10. Mm -hmm. Notice I didn't say 1 Corinthians. That's a bad joke. <laughs> <laughs> but let's, let's just take Romans to start out with. He's, he's first in line here. And look at the first chapter, verse 27. And men, instead of having normal sexual relationships with women, burned with lust for each other, men did shameful things with other men, and as a result, suffered within themselves the penalty they so richly deserved. Hmm. Okay, that's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. Now the Message Bible. But the basic reality, now it's at the bottom, worst, sexually confused, they abused and defiled one another. Women with women, men with men, all lust, no love, hmm. and then they paid for it. Hmm. Uh, so the clarity depends upon which one you're looking at. Right. And that, after all, this is an evangelical. Mm -hmm. they're, they're very strongly against gay marriage and mm -hmm. very strongly against homosexuality. Mm -hmm. So you would expect a stronger translation mm -hmm. of that. Right. If you go to some of the older translations, mm -hmm. things start to moderate somewhat. Mm -hmm. We're always looking for moderation. Mm -hmm. After all, that's the Greek way of life. You're right. Um, so men leave the natural use of women, burn the, in their lust toward one another. That's sticking with the same kind of, of, of approach. Mm -hmm. How are they going to change this? You could change it by noting that this is applied to individuals that, whether they're homosexual or heterosexual, mm -hmm. are consumed with sex. Mm -hmm. And that it has nothing mm -hmm. to do with their identity mm -hmm. as a homosexual, mm -hmm. but has to do with their perversion mm -hmm. or their care acting it out mm -hmm. in excessive ways. Mm -hmm. That's one way of spinning this right. so that you don't come down on the side of uh, this against mm -hmm. people that are gay. Mm -hmm. um, if you take another one of those scriptures, and we'll move to 1 Corinthians, next in line, um, it is it is a less it is less uh, subject to clarity and more subject to confusion mm -hmm. because that's where you you come decide what did Paul mean by certain words mm -hmm. and his words are not always very clear. Yeah. In summary, I quote Paul in First Corinthians mm -hmm. fourteen thirty three. He says, "God is not a god of confusion." I think I've established the case. <laughs> Well, we have to leave it there. I wish we had more time. Uh, thank you for joining us on Atheist Talk. Uh, please visit our website, uh, apply for a free copy of our newsletter, and see what we have to offer. Thank you for watching.